I just trust Him. Trust His Word. If there's anything I can do to tell you today, like I do every day that we come together, is I want you to believe what God says. Because what He says is alive and full of power. It's His Word. And His Word that is alive and full of power, if you open your heart to it, it'll get on the inside of you and change it. No one can open that door to your heart except you, yourself. Faith comes by hearing. And then hearing comes by the Word of God. We have to be open and receptive to God's Word, and it will change you. It'll do more to change you than you can do by changing yourself. Amen. And this is a glorious day. We've been talking about it since Easter. It's the day of Pentecost. Uh, I was looking at it a couple weeks ago, and one, one group says it's last Sunday. This one group says it's this Sunday. I mean, we, we said last week we were going to celebrate them both. And I see with Paul and a couple others, it, it says in the scriptures that they, 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 he wanted to get somewhere so that he could get there in time to celebrate Pentecost with the body of believers. Pentecost was 50 days after the first Sabbath of the Passover. And so it's Pentecost means 50. It's 47 sevens plus one day. And it was the uh, festival of the harvest. And they would celebrate God bringing them the Word of God on that day. Shavuot, I think is a Hebrew name for it. And on that same day where God, where they celebrated God bringing the Word to his, his believers, on that same day, He gave us the Holy Spirit. <laughs> the thing that had been prophesied for so long, John the Baptist was baptizing when Jesus came along. He was in the River Jordan. And when Jesus came into the water, John took him under the water and brought him back up. And he looked and he saw the Spirit of God descend upon him. And he said to everyone within earshot, this is the day the Lord told me about when he called me into ministry. He said on a day that I would see the Spirit of God descend upon a man and remain his. He said, this is what God told me when he called me into ministry. God called John into his ministry and told him when he called him that one day, because he, he was called to a ministry of baptism and repentance. Repent because the kingdom of God's at hand. He said, get it, get it right because God's coming. Amen. <clears throat> and so he did. And he would, he would baptize, and they would come to ask him, why are you doing this? And he would tell them. But on this day, God had prophesied to John that one day you would see the Spirit of God descend upon a man and remain. John said that when he called me, that's what he told me, and this is him. This day, this guy is going to... See, God told me that he would baptize people with the Holy Ghost and fire. You notice he didn't say, this is the one that's going to get you saved. Which is important, which you must do before you can be baptized with the Holy Spirit. But he said, this is the one that's going to baptize people with the Holy Ghost and fire. Wow. But what John knew, that was the most important thing that Jesus was coming to do. And I agree. I'm a Pentecost guy. I'm not, I'm not part of the Pentecost and the Holiness Church, but I believe in Pentecost. I believe in what Jesus talked so much about about this day that we celebrate today. He appeared to his disciples for 40 days after he was gone for three. So that's 43 days. Well, between 43 and 50, I don't know if he showed up every day of those 40, but somewhere there was seven days left over. But the last time he saw them, he said, now you guys go wait in Jerusalem for the promise you've heard me talk about. And you can see this in the first chapter of Acts. He said, go wait in Jerusalem for the promise you've heard me talk about. And he said that is reference to John 14, which we'll look at in a second. We kind of look at it every week. He said, because you will receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you and you'll be my witnesses. Wow. He said, don't go do anything. Don't go start any ministry. 
I dare say there's a lot of ministry started without spirit-filled believers leading it. A lot of the translations were done by people not spirit-filled. The ones that were done by spirit-filled translators, those are the ones I read the most <clears throat> because they understand it. And if you don't understand <clears throat> this baptism of the Holy Ghost, you have a hard time explaining this stuff when it comes, when it talks about us being filled with God. Being filled with God's Spirit living on the inside of us. And if the devil can keep you thinking that you're not worthy, and we know we weren't worthy, but God, through His righteousness, made us worthy. And again, it has nothing to do with us. And the thing that Christian police are watching out for is that we don't get too big-headed or too out of, out of line or off track or whatever. And I agree with them. But you'll never be what God wants you or calls you to be unless you believe him for what he said. Jesus became sin for us. Who knew no sin that you and I would become the righteousness of God in him. That makes us worthy in Christ. Without him, without him, nothing's impossible. I mean, nothing's possible. But with him, nothing's impossible. And we're worthy in God's eyes. Because he sees us in him. Ephesians 2 says, Even when we were dead in our trespasses and sin, he raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ. Even but when we were dead in our trespasses and sins, God sees through that and sees the completed work of Christ in you and me before we ever walk it out. In fact, he goes to the end of our times and puts purpose in our life and then walks it back and then teaches us how to walk out what he's called us to and then gives us credit for it. When we know, <laughs> of course, Jesus says, one guy came to Jesus and says, good teacher. He says, whoa. There's none good but God. Now, all the universe is worshiping him, or should be. <clears throat> but he said there's none good but God. He, he knew his place with his father, but he also knew his place with his father. He knew that's his father and he's his son. He's obedient to his father, but God exalted him. And he raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ. I'm not trying to tell us that we're all that. What I'm trying to tell us with Christ in us, we are all. He said we are. That blows my mind. <laughs> and I don't see the church walking in it. I mean, just take, just take what Jesus commanded us, and I'll, I'll start there. In Matthew 28, now, it's easy sometimes to think that the things that God's called us to and what he called the first disciples to and the first apostles to were two different worlds. And as long as we stay in the ditch, it will be. But he's called us to be, well, we have a hard time just trying to be what the apostles were, but heck, Jesus said we're supposed to keep our eyes on him and be like him, greater than the apostles. Because we're going to be like him. But whatever he told them to do, he told them to teach us to do. Wow. At Matthew 28, verse 18, Jesus came close to them and said, All the authority in the universe has been given to me. All the authority in all created matter, everything that has existence has been given to me. By the way, we're joint heirs with him. Did you know that? We're heirs. Romans 8 says they were heirs. Heirs of God and joint heirs with Jesus Christ. So whatever he has, he shares with us. Amen. Now wherever you go, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and then... Teach them to faithfully follow all that I've commanded you. Everything that God commanded Jesus to do, he taught the disciples to do. 
And he said in John, as the Father sends, has sent me, just the same way that the Father sends me, I'm sending you. <laughs> That's what he told them. Well, guess what they were supposed to do? Tell us the same thing. That we're called to do the same thing that the disciples did, that Jesus did, that the Father commissioned us to do. Teach them to faithfully follow all that I've commanded you and never forget that I am with you every day, even to the completion of the age. And you know the Great Commission, these signs will follow believers. Not just the fivefold ministry, but these signs would follow believers. In my name, they'll cast out devils. They'll speak with new tongues. They'll take up or handle snakes and not get hurt. If they drink any deadly thing, it won't hurt them. And believers would lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. This is really Jesus 101. But for some, it seems so wild and outside of what we normally see. These signs would follow them that believe. In Luke 24, verse 44, then Jesus said to them, don't you remember the words I spoke to you when I was still with you? Now this is after he was raised from the dead and they're with him before he's gone on up. In fact, when he goes up, they just watch him ascend up into the heavens and they're just standing there looking. The angel says, hey, that same Jesus had just left, he'll come back the same way he went. He's coming back. That same Jesus he said, don't you remember the words I spoke to you when I was still with you? I told you that I would fulfill everything written about me, including all the prophecies from the law of Moses through the Psalms and the writings of the prophets. He supernaturally unlocked their understanding to receive the revelation of the scriptures. And he said to them, everything that has, that has happened fulfills what the scripture prophesied of me. Everything that's been written about me has been fulfilled. Why is that? Because he listened to the Father. Everything that's been written about you and me will be fulfilled if we listen to the Father. And if we believe what he says. The consummate battle of the age is either believe in God or not. That's why I said it. My goal is, my desire is for you to believe what God said. And it's your choice. It's not something you have no control over. When you've made up your mind, you're going to believe. In fact, you ought to make up your mind at this point in time that whatever God says, I'm going to believe it. Instead of reading something and then trying to figure out if you can believe that or not. You need to go ahead and decide and once and for all that whatever God says, we're going to believe. And they asked him one time, I, I, it's right here, but I'll, I'll just go ahead and tell you. They said, well, what, what can we do that we do the works of God? He said, well, doing the works of God begins with believing on him who sent him. If you want to do the works of God, first thing you got to do is believe the one that sent him. That's God. Amen. You're going to have to believe what God thinks. Say amen. Amen. I appreciate that. We're going to have to believe what God said. Everything that happens fulfills, everything that has happened fulfilled what the scriptures prophesied of me. The Messiah was destined to suffer and rise from the dead on the third day. They must go to all the nations and preach repentance and forgiveness of sins that they were turned to me. Same thing we're called to do. Repent. Uh, we can't give this gospel and say, you can just live any way you want to. Now he says, hi, you need to change your ways. Come into the kingdom, but you're going to have to repent. It doesn't mean you just sit around and just ball and squall over your past. Just repent, make a change. Repent means to turn. Change the way you've been going. If I've been walking this way, to repent means I just turn and do opposite of what I've been doing. And I begin to listen to God. And, the, and Corinthians tells us that when we turn to the Lord in repentance, the veil's lifted and he begins to reveal things to us that we couldn't see before we repented. Repentance brings revelation. Not sorrow that you got caught, but sorrow for what you've been doing. And I don't spend a lot of time on repentance and changing because my main thing is here come meet Jesus and then do whatever he tells you to do <laughs> then go read what he says and he'll tell you how to live I don't have to sit there and shake my finger at you and tell you or we don't have to as believers go out and shake our finger at the world so you're just a sin and you're just a sin because they probably know it and <laughs> they don't want to necessarily stop 
And we're not called just to go and just shame people, but called to love them. Like he loved us, right? On that night before he was taken, they were all arguing about who's going to be the greatest. And he said, you know, I'm mad living. But he says, they need to know what, what it really means to be the greatest. So he takes off his robe, ties a towel around his waist, and washes every disciple's feet. And said, now, I'm your master. And that's true, I am. And you serve me. But if I am your master and I wash your feet, if the creator of the universe, God Jesus is God in the flesh, living under the restrictions of a man on this earth, because he cannot call us to do what he did if what he did was doing it as God. But he did it as a man anointing with God, and that we can do. If the anointing is available to us like it was to him, right? That, that 14th chapter of John where he's talking to his disciples says, I'm going to go prepare a place for you. In my father's house are many houses. God's house is full of houses. Think about that. I used to say, well, that in my father's house are many land, any mansions or landed estates. Well, maybe so. I mean, we're thinking about what kind of house we're going to have when we get to heaven, and that's probably the, the lowest common denominator for how to translate that, what he told them. In my father's house are many houses or dwelling places for God. We as a body of Christ are the dwelling place from God, and the scriptures remind us, particularly in Romans, that we don't forget that we are the temple of the Holy Ghost. How can we be a temple of the Holy Ghost if the Holy Ghost doesn't live in us? But in my Father's house are many dwelling places for God. And in that dwelling place is the body of Christ and God's kingdom and his house where he lives in it and we live. In it. And Jesus says, I will be in you and you will be in me and I'm in him. So he invites us to be not only filled with God, but for us to be in him too. That's a lot. He said, in my father's house and many dwelling places, if it weren't so, I'd tell you. And I'm going to go prepare a place for you. And where I'm going, you know. Thomas said, we don't know where you're going. How do we know the way if we don't know where? He says, I am the way. You do know the way, Thomas, because I am the way. You've known me. And he said, from now on, you know the father and you've seen him. And Philip said, Lord, just show it to us. Show him to us. And we'll be satisfied. He said, Philip, how long have I been with you? If you've seen me, you have seen the Father. Don't you believe that the Father's living in me and I'm living in him? If you don't believe me for what I say, at least I'll let the miracles, signs and wonders convince you that I'm in him and he's in me. Don't you believe that I'm in him? And then he said this, and if you believe on me, then the works I've been doing, you'll do. The works, the miracles, signs, and wonders that would signify to you that I'm living in the Father and the Father's in me. If, I, if, if you believe that, then you'll do what I did. And even greater works because I'm going to my Father. Wow. I'm going to read that to you from that point. I think I one. Yeah, here it is. And even doing greater miracles is because I'm going to be my father. For I will do whatever you ask me to do when you ask me in my name. I will do. Listen to this. I will do whatever you ask me to do when you ask me in my name. What do we believe? Y'all still alive? Just say something. There you go. I will do whatever you ask me to do when you ask me my name. And that is how the Son will show what the Father is really like and bring glory to Him. If we ask Jesus for something in His name, He does it. That gives God glory. 
not just filling our pockets. <laughs> we glorify God when he manifests through us. And we can't ask for things personally, but, and we can use our faith to get our needs met, and he intends for us to do so, but that's the lowest, that's the introductory level into walking in faith is to trust God for our finances. What he really wants you to be trained in faith for is to go do the work he's called you to. Amen? Because, I mean, you know, I mean, it's okay to have your needs met, but if, to be fulfilled and filled with his spirit and go out and change the world and heal the sick and raise the dead and cast out devils and cleanse lepers, you won't do that without him living in you and without you living in him. And when you do that, it gives him glory. Colossians says, Christ in you, the anointing of God in you, the hope or the expectation of the glory of God. <clears throat> what, what is the glory of God? Him living in us. And us doing what he's called us to do. Amen. Fruit. He talks about fruit. What is the fruit? Well, the fruit of the spirit of the things he does in us. When he's talking about us bearing fruit in the kingdom, he's not talking about what he's done in us. It's what he's gonna, what we're gonna do with him to the world around us, which is the reason we're here. Do you understand? Do you understand? You have a reason to be on this earth. Sometimes we wonder, well, why am I even here? Well, it ain't about us. <laughs> Why did Jesus come? You know, he didn't, wasn't anything about him at all that he came for? Not one thing, except for the fact he loved us and he wanted to see us raised back up with him. But besides that, it was all about somebody else. His whole life was dedicated to serving someone else. Amen. To the point he's the greatest servant, or the least, which became the greatest. <laughs> Think about that. He made of himself no reputation and he washed their feet to show them, I can't do anything without him. And I'm not here to build my ministry. In fact, when the crowds got big, he started telling things and they just ran. Like, if you really want to walk this way, you're going to have to eat my flesh and drink my blood. I'm going to we're out of here. Honey, pack your bags. We ain't following this cat no more. He done lost his mind. And he, and he, and he shook them down to 12. He goes, you guys leaving too? Peter went, I'm mad living. Well, you gave us a good opportunity, but we ain't got no place to go. You speak the words of life. At least we're smart enough to know what's coming out of your mouth is life to us. And I don't understand what you just said, but I can't unhook right now. I got to stay with you. And we need to stay hooked with him. And every one of us in here, some of us think, we ought not be hooked because of our past. That's why he came, because of our past. <laughs> you know he fixed your past before you ever created it? Before you ever got in the ditch, he had the ditch mover for you? Whatever you needed, he fixed it 2,000 years before you got here. I think he has a little bit of a clue of what we need. And he fixed it. So get your eyes off yourself. You know, I, I, that's what the Lord told me this morning. <clears throat> in so many words. Because it's easy for us to feel not worthy. Am I worthy to be up here? Not outside of him. And if I focus on me, I'll talk myself out of it. Even when I know he's called me to do it, I can question that if I get in a pity party or look at me and say, well, man, I ain't all that in a bag of chips. But Jesus says, I'm making myself nothing. I can do nothing of myself. Well, if Jesus can do nothing of himself, thank God we're on the same team because we can't do anything by ourselves. But we're not by ourselves. Every one of us has access to God right now, right now. And this is the, Lord, the word the Lord told me. Uh, one, it was yesterday morning and one before. He says, tell them this is for you. This is for you. 
This, we belong to this kingdom. This kingdom was designed for us. He had us in mind when he called us. This is for you. If you can hear my voice, and I don't know if you're like in the, in the sanctuary here today or online, here's one thing you need to know. This word is for you. This gospel is for you. This kingdom is for you. This Holy Spirit is for you. There was not one person ever been born that was not worthy to receive the Holy Spirit because of Jesus' blood. It was made intended for everyone who would say yes and not be talked out by the devil or this kingdom of this world to keep you from being who you want you to be. If I can keep the ammunition out of my, my enemy's hands, he can't fight. If he can keep the Holy Spirit out of you, you can't fight. Oh, you'll fight in your own efforts and you'll be tired and you won't win. You may get a little victory here and there, but it won't be the one he called you about that's where, and I think that was something Kelly said this morning, my, my yoke is easy, my burdens are light. If you're struggling through this, you're in the wrong fight because it's not supposed to be hard. It's supposed to be easy. The way in is narrow. There's one way. That's a narrow way. But once you get through that door, it's wide open. Beyond your wildest dreams, imagination, or what you can think of, or what you can pray. He's able to do far over and above all that you could dare ask, think, or pray. The only person that can limit God in our lives is ourselves. And you have as much of God living on the inside of you as you have faith for. All you got to do is just expand your imagination. You can't outdream him. You can't outimagine him. You're not going to make him mad by wanting more of him. And, and you know, even the spiritual gifts, you know, there's nine gifts that we don't hit. Paul said, covet those. We're not supposed to covet anything except those gifts. Word of wisdom, word of knowledge, discerning the spirits. Working in miracles, special faith, healings, tongues, interpretation of tongues, and prophecy. He said, covet those things. God's never told us to covet anything except that. <laughs> so if you get filled with the Holy Ghost and you want to walk in those gifts, go after it because that's what he told us to do. He said, seek, or eat, go earnestly after these. <laughs> and we sit around, well, one day I guess I'm going to start prophesying. Just sitting, you just waiting on it to come. You just sitting there waiting on God to show up. <laughs> That's what Bill, I heard Bill say this this week that applies right here. He'll give you what you need, but what you want, you'll have to go get yourself. Let's go. <laughs> and I'll tell you, this church is going after it. Amen. And I don't care what people Amen. say. Hallelujah. I'm tired of being moved by what people are thinking, not doing anything. Amen. But sitting around wishing we were the days of the early church. We're the days of the most victorious church. I mean, my goodness, look at the, look at the victory and battle that we can win with him on our side. Bishop said, this is a healing center. I'm going to declare it. I don't know where you are, if you're watching, but God's going to heal in this place and in your place. If you, it's not restricted, but we're going to, the reason we pray on Wednesdays, because we're hungry for God. And I was listening to a tape from Bill last week, and he's talking about praise. He's, we, like he said that movie about Rocky Three, when Rocky says, I'm going to fight this Mr. T, but what, I can't remember what his name is on the new movie. He says, you ain't going to fight that guy. He'll kill you. He'll kill you to death. He said, what are you talking about? I'm going to take him. He said, no, he said, about those last five fights I won, they were hand-picked. Did you win? I won. You won them, but you didn't pick them. We picked them until you win. I'm going to fight Mr. T. No, you're not. He says, I'm going to go back to the old gym, the old place we used to be. I'm going to work out there. And so he went back to the gym. Went back to the old place he started. We need to go back where we started on our knees. <laughs> And, you know, what Bill said, I'm just going to tell you, that's why I sent it out to everybody, because I want you to know how important prayer is for this church. He said, I'm going to make it 11 o'clock. I'm not saying this. I'm saying that's what he said. I'm going to make it 11 o'clock at night for those that don't, don't come on this, that are hungry for it. 
Well, it's hard on my schedule. Well, are you hungry? Do you care about the future? Do you care about what God's called us to? You can't lay down some own stuff to seek his face, to change his city. We make time for the stuff we want to do. The effectual fervent prayers of righteous men and women make tremendous power available, dynamic, and it's working. Amen. Come if you're hungry. Don't if you ain't. Because you're muddy to waters. Because we need to be of one heart, one mind, and one spirit. And when that happens, and when we come together like that, the house will shake. And that just wasn't for a sign so that one day we would wish for something like this in our day, in our time. <laughs> We're in the latter days, the latter of the latter days. And it's supposed to be better now than it was then. Hallelujah. I didn't mean to step on your toes, but you did have them sticking out there a little bit. If he puts it in my heart and burdens me, it's because that's what he wants for this church. Uh, it's not because I'm anything. I ain't nothing but a bag. I ain't even a bag of chips. But if he burdens me with it, and I tell you, it's because God burdens me with it, and we need it. And the disciples one time, they come back and mark the ninth chapter, and Jesus has been on the Mount of Transfiguration, and we're doing all these stupid, silly, religious things. I mean, uh, Elijah and Moses show up and... <laughs> Peter says, hey, look at this, it's cool. Why don't we build some temples? Peter, just watch, will you? Don't be so crazy. Don't get religious on me. And God just pours out his glory on him. They come down off the mountain. His face is still glistening. And they come to a group where his disciples, the other nine are. And they're circled up with a mob of people. And Jesus says, what are you questioning my guys for? And a father comes out and says, well, I've got a son. I brought him to your disciples. Who had, this, my son has a demonic spirit, and I've came, brought him to your disciples to set him free, to heal him, to deliver him. And they could not. Could not means they did not have the ability to. He'd have been better assertive if he said they would not. But Jesus says, you unbelieving things. How long am I going to be here? Bring him to me. When Jesus said, bring him to me, he says, I know what to do. Who does he think he is? I can do nothing of myself. The only reason I can say, come bring him to me, because my father called me to do it. And if he called me to do it, it'll get done. Bring him here. And they brought that boy to Jesus. And as soon as that demon in the boy saw Jesus and the spirit in him, it threw the kid on the ground. He began to wallow and foam at the mouth and having a seizure. And Jesus says, he knows he didn't go into emergency tongues and start laying and hollering and yelling at him. He watched him on the floor. He says, how long has he been like this? He says, from a child. And oftentimes they try to throw him in the fire to burn him or put him in the water to drown him. But, but if you can do anything, have compassion and help us. If you can do anything. Which is probably about the lowest level of faith you could have said. If you can do anything. God, if you can do anything, there's nothing impossible for me, son. Nothing. Except what I said I would or would not do. Well, there's any, anything you want good, he already promises yours. Everything that heaven contains has been lavished upon us already. We're not waiting on him to do it. Anything you want good from God, He's made available to you. Why don't we have it? We don't believe him. We don't think it's here yet. That maybe one day it'll show up. He says, how long I'll be with y'all? Bring him to me. The, thing, the, the demon throws him on the ground and he begins to wall and foam. And he looks and sees a crowd come. I don't know how, he may have sat there and taught for five or ten more minutes. If the, the crowd didn't start coming, but he saw the crowd coming and he said, come out of here. Don't go in him ever again. And it threw him out so violently that everybody said he's dead. Now they immediately went to their dark thoughts again that here's the master of the universe casting the devil out who's subservient to all things and us. 
And he casts him out and lays the boy out and they think, well, the devil won, the boy's dead. Why is it we always revert to the most negative? We got to think the positive. Here's the son of God. <laughs> Nothing impossible for him. Peter got a glimpse of it when he stepped out of the boot. <laughs> Jesus says, come. That's all the word he needed to give Peter to walk on water. And Peter walked on water and then he began to sink. <laughs> you ever jumped in the water and began to sink? No, you go right to the bottom as fast as you jump in. <laughs> so Peter was starting to go down. Jesus grabbed him by the hand. And they walk back to the boat. Now you can talk about Peter if you want, but until you walk on water, <laughs> you can't say too much to Peter. <laughs> really? So Jesus grabs the boy by the hand. He's not dead. And, he's, and he reaches down and grabs him and pulls him up. And the boy begins to walk and talk. Because Jesus knew what the Father told him to do and Jesus was obedient, and he heard from God. You know what we need to do? Hear from God and be obedient. And we're obedient because we trust him to do what he said he would do. <laughs> well, I'm going to pray, Brother Noble. Let's see what God does. You might as well go shoot pool. Because he ain't going to get nothing like that. We're going to have to believe him that God's going to do what he said he's going to do. Oh, there's two things I want to share. I don't know if I can get it in. And this is how the son will show what the father's really like and will bring glory to him. Ask me anything in my name and I'll do it. Abraham had a promise from God. And it says that when he did not weaken in faith, but he gave praise and glory to God. When Isaac was born, they gave God glory. They didn't go, glory to God. No. <clears throat> when this impossible thing happened, and here's this boy, that was glorious. And it gave God glory because, like Nicodemus said to Jesus, you must not be by yourself. You must be with God. Because you can't do what you're doing. And everybody looked at Abraham and said, my goodness, there is a God of Abraham. Because he must be alive. Because he has a baby. And they're past age. And if you do your study, after Sarah died, he had some more. <laughs> he wasn't shooting blanks, you know that? <laughs> and that's what made... Sarah's so mad, she said, well, you, you so, you so something. Go sleep with Hagar, see if you can have one with her. And he did. And she did. And it made her so mad, she hated that boy, and she hated that girl from then on. Because it pointed back to her that the problem was physically with her. But why did she care? She already had a promise from God. When we don't believe the promise of God, we're going to get mad at somebody else. And blame them or blame somebody else for what only God can do. And let me tell you something. We can't do it without Him. But with Him, nothing is impossible. Amen. When Jesus was with His disciples, after He was raised from the dead, He breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. That's when they got born again. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and if you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, then are you saved? You know they couldn't get saved until they believed that Jesus was raised from the dead and until he was Lord of their life. But before the cross, they weren't saved. After Jesus was raised from the dead and they believed, then they could be saved. But then he said, now you go wait for the promise of the Father, which you've heard me talk about. For you shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And you'll be my witnesses. Yeah, but didn't they receive the Holy Spirit? You had to be born again. And every one of us, when we get born again, God lives in us. Whether you believe in it or not, he comes and dwells in us and has as much access as we give him. 
And through unbelief, we give him none. Nor do we get rest. But he told those same ones that had just been born again to go wait for more of the Holy Spirit that's different than the first one. I, I can't necessarily draw it, but it was a second and subsequent step. There was something about this Holy Spirit coming to live on the inside of us that was different than you get when you get born again. And I can't, I can't fully explain it, but I do know this, that it was important to Jesus to talk about it here in John 14. And listen to what it says about this. The world it says, I'm going to pray the Father and he'll give you another Savior. Now I'm going to give you the definition of that. The Holy Spirit of truth who will be to you a friend just like me. And he will never leave you. He will be with you forever. When you get to heaven, you'll still be full of the Holy Spirit. Forever. The world won't receive him because they can't see him or know him. But you know him intimately because he remains with you. But he will live on the inside of you. And I promise that I'll never leave you helpless or abandon you as orphans. I will come back to you. But that word, I will pray the Father, he'll give you another Savior, the Holy Spirit of truth. That Greek word used here is parakletos. It's a technical word that can be translated defense attorney. It means one called to stand next to you as a helper. Various translations have rendered this counselor, comforter, advocate, encourager, intercessor, or helper. Who, however, none of these words alone are adequate and fall short in explaining the full meaning. This translation has chosen the word Savior for it depicts the role of the Holy Spirit to protect, defend, and save us from ourselves and our enemies and keep us whole and healed. He is the one who guides and defends, comforts and consoles. Keep in mind that the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of Christ, our Savior. The Aramaic, the Aramaic word is paraglita, which is taken from two work words, prog and in. Prog, which means to end, finish or save, and then lita means the curse. It means to end the curse. What a beautiful word picture. The Holy Spirit comes to end the work of the curse or sin in our lives and to save us from every effect. Paraglita means a redeemer who ends the curse. Hallelujah. We're redeemed from the curse of the law. Christ has redeemed us from the curse. And we are members of the body of Christ to go declare it. And be filled with his spirit. I don't know, it seems like since 1900, 1905, really early 1900, that midnight, when a group out in Topeka, Kansas started believing for the Holy Ghost, they wanted what the book of Acts was talking about. 1905, I think my grandfather got filled, or 1904, or 1906, was Azusa Street. It happened in such magnitude that people came from all over the world to see what was going on. People were getting healed, delivered, set free. The power of God was moving just like in Jesus' meetings that he had. And we began to do what Jesus told us to do was to go do the works that he did and even greater works. And it became a battle land for the body of Christ for the last 115, 20 years between the so-called Pentecostals and the non-Pentecostals. We're called as a members of the body of Christ to be like him, to submit ourselves to him, to repent, to accept his forgiveness, be filled with his spirit, and then be equipped by his Holy Ghost, his Holy Spirit in us to go do the work that he's called us to. And we should be doing it. And we will do it. He's coming back for a church without spot or wrinkle. Hallelujah. They're not going to be doubting this. And I don't know if it's a remnant or what it is. But I fully intend for us and to this church and everything that we do to be in line with what he's called us to be and to go do. The reason that we're here is to make disciples of this city to fulfill everything God's called us all to, to go do. With his Holy Spirit empowering us to do things he's called us to do that are impossible. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. And that's what we're going to do. Amen. And so the one thing we're going to do right now is curse cancer. And I do it every time we pray. Every time I minister, the Lord asked me to curse cancer. 
and I just lost one of my family members over on Friday to cancer. And you can say, well, I'll just quit. No, I ain't quitting. I'm fighting even harder. I am sick of cancer taking lives out to the body of Christ when we are, have the upper hand. Jesus' name is above cancer. Amen. He told us to heal the sick, raise the dead, cast out devils, and cleanse the lepers. He may have won a battle from time to time, but he's going to lose the war. And we are going to fight the good fight of faith whereunto we have been called. Jesus told us to heal the sick, raise the dead, cast out devils, cleanse the lepers. One way we do it is through the speaking word. Jesus spoke to a fig tree, spoke to the wind and the waves, and spoke to the, the fever that was on Peter's mother-in-law. And he said, stop. And it listened to him. And one account says he answered the fever. The fever must have been talking. He told her to shut up and get out. And we're going to do the same thing. Whether in here in this church or wherever at home you're watching this, and maybe it may be 10 years from now you listen to this. Still the word is true. If you have cancer in your body, I want you to stand up. If you know someone in your family that has cancer, I want you to stand up. If you, if, if you know someone. If someone in your family has cancer, I want you to stand up. Or if you know somebody that has cancer, I want you to stand on their behalf. If you have cancer, someone in your family or someone you know. The devil could go, well, you lost one. Buddy, you're going to lose the whole thing. But in the middle, we're gonna, in the moment, we're going to take you down. And if you have any other sickness, any other disease, any addiction, any any abnormality, any malady, any depression, any oppression, anything unlike this peace of God that God's talking about, that we've been redeemed from the curse by the Holy Spirit, you can also stand to your feet because after we curse cancer, we're going to deal with that. Amen. We're going to have a healing minute and that's all it takes. And Olivia, I got you covered. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And when I tell you to call their name out, if it's your name, call it out. If it's someone else's name, you call it out. Cancer first, and then we're going to do these other deals. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, by the authority vested in us as members of his body, warriors in his kingdom, we curse cancer to its core. Cancer, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I curse you. And in the bodies of all those we call out right now, and I'm going to call a list of names out. Surely. Richard, Chris, Darnell, Eileen's Hill, Bridget, Leslie, Blake, Paul, Jack, Lee, Tony, Marsha, Sean, Alice, Peter, Cross, Linda, Billy, Jill, Thomas, Jillian, Cole, and Sherry. That list is too long. Cancer in these bodies, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we curse you to your very core. and We command you to die. Cease and cease your maneuvers. Come out of their body and loose them and let them go. If this cancer is not physiological, but, but demonic in nature, sometimes it is. Sometimes Jesus casts out the devil, sometimes he healed them. If this cancer is demonic in nature, then in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, you foul spirits behind the spirit of cancer, we curse you, we command you, loose them and let them go, come out of them in Jesus' name. Furthermore, if there's any cancer in this room, unknown, undetected, just beginning in, the, in our bodies or in your home, or in the sound of my voice. Cancer, we curse you to your very root. We command you to dissipate, cease and cease your maneuvers and come out of their body in Jesus' name and leave no scar tissue behind. And every sickness and every disease within the sound of my voice, any abnormality, any malady, any oppression, any addiction, any stronghold, we break your back in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ from our lips. He said we would heal the sick and we will. By the power of the Holy Ghost that dwells in us and, and, and abides and rides on the words that we declare in line with his words, we say stop and be healed from the top of your head to the bottoms of your feet. Every cell, every tissue, every fiber of your being alive with the life of God functioning in the perfection that God created to function. We forbid any malfunction in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. We proclaim healing in this land, in this city. Contrary to the world system, we declare the healing power of the kingdom of God that's evident and present with us today. 
In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah. 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 Praise God. Hallelujah. 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 For the Lord is good, and his mercy endures forever. For the Lord is good, and his mercy endures forever. For the Lord is good, and his mercy endures forever. Before, before we go, this is kingdom living. We're talking about living in the kingdom of God. There's only one way into the kingdom, that's through Jesus Christ. We have to declare him Lord of our life. Surrender and say, Jesus, you're Lord of my life. And we also have to, also too, we have to believe that God raised him from the dead. And then we're born again. We don't really have to do much except declare truth that we've heard and lay down our life and let him be Lord of our life. That means whatever he says, if he says do this, you say, yes, sir, Jesus, you're Lord of my life. You're the general. You're the, you're the leader of my life. And I'm going to do what you tell me to do. I'm not moved by the fear of men. I'm moved by the fear of God. And Jesus, you're Lord. So perhaps if, you're not, if you don't know Jesus as Lord of your life, today's a good day to do that. And if you've never been filled with the Holy Spirit, my goodness, what are you waiting on? Armageddon? <laughs> Be filled with this. They got filled 2,000 years ago. For your benefit and for mine. And thank God it hasn't been stolen from the church and it's roaring back. Amen. He said if you ask him, he would fill you with his Holy Spirit. So we're going to pray, one, to be born again, and two, to be filled with his Holy Ghost. And let him in. Let him come live on the inside of you. And if you're still not clear, come to Bible study Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. We'll make it clear every day. Amen. Well, just pick up the book. <laughs> read John 14, 15, 16, 17, and read the first book of Acts and the second book of Acts. You'll see what you're called to. So if you would, as believers or non-believers, you want to come to the kingdom, I want, you to, I want you to say this prayer out loud with me. How many believers we got in here? All right, I want to hear your voice. Eh? Repeat this after me. Heavenly Father. Now y'all can pray a little bit better than that. I mean, the, the house that they prayed was shaking. They, had, they were yelling. Heavenly Father. Heavenly Father. Today. I've heard your gospel message, and I believe the truth. I declare Jesus is now Lord of my life. I believe in my heart, Father God, that you raised him from the dead. And now I'm saved. Now take my life and do something with it. Now that I'm born again, I ask you, to fill me with your Holy Spirit. Just like on the day of Pentecost, which we celebrate today. And actually, we celebrate it every Sunday. Hallelujah. So fill me, Lord, afresh anew. And I receive your Holy Spirit now. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Hallelujah. Praise God. Glory to God. Glory to God.